Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong. My name is d -Base, and I'm going to take you back to the archive of nostalgic Mormon videos to bring you some of the most entertaining and obscure uh, videos produced by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brigham Young University, and unofficial LDS-centric filmmakers. This show, which this is the pilot for, and it's going to highlight the faith promoting cinematic gems along with a few cringeworthy whoppers. You aren't going to read these hard to find movie reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. So join us on this Mormon cinematic adventure and watch to see what masterpieces or flops we uncover when we dust off the VHS and beta tapes. Now our first movie that we're going to be reviewing is the 1963 Windows of Heaven movie, which uh, you'll see the, uh, this is Francis Uri right here. And we're going to be reviewing this movie. Now, there's been a number of scholarly articles about this particular uh, movie. And the most famous of which is E.J. Bell's The Windows of Heaven Revisited, the, the 1899 Tithing Reformation. So that's going to be linked into our show notes. So we also have a show website on YouTube. It's a Mormon Movie Reviews. Just find us on YouTube, and this is going to be the pilot episode. Or you can send us an email to mormonmoviereviews at gmail.com. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and kick this off right now. So this Mormon Movie Reviews works best if you have uh, previously watched The Windows of Heaven. And obviously there's going to be a spoiler alert. Um, by the way, we I'm going to take quite a few uh, pauses for commentary and talk over the dialogue of some of the least important scenes. So basically, this is a director's commentary without the director. So let me give you a summary uh, of the movie first. So in 1899, an aging Mormon prophet, Lorenzo Snow, he's deeply troubled by the church's crippling debt left over from the anti-polygamy crusades of the 1880s. He feels prompted to travel to St. George, Utah, which is experiencing a tremendous drought. And while he was preaching in the tabernacle there, he receives a revelation to reemphasize the law of tithing as the solution to the saints' financial troubles. Furthermore, in this video, he promises rain in St. George if they will faithfully pay their tithing. A tithing reformation begins, and throughout the Utah Territory, pioneer settlements, and eventually St. George uh, receives rain and the church climbs out of debt by the 1960s. Now, we are not the first ones to attempt to do this, by the way. We have the Latter-day Vault, by the way, which uh, has done this movie review before. However, they did it in a text format, not in a video format like I'm going to do today. So, the, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles actually approved this movie script. And because of uh, an expensive church building program and other causes, the church commissioned this video in 1959 and eventually released it in 1963. So, in the late 1950s, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was in a serious financial crisis. And the presiding bishopric commissioned this film from the BYU Motion Picture Studio with the hopes of a donation reformation similar to the one that the movie depicts in 1899. So uh, from the title credits, uh, the most important actor in this is uh, probably Francis Uri. So Francis Uri is playing the role of Lorenzo Snow, which is the fifth uh, LDS president. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, church president. Now, Francis Uri, he was known as a Utah-based prominent uh, radio, stage, and film actor. He was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, best known for his works in films like Johnny Lingo. Uh, that's Johnny Lingo right there. And also uh, Uncle Ben and other church commission films. Uh, uh, he was a popular artist. He joined the Kappa, uh, staff of KUTA. Um, and he played a number of different roles, as you can see here. And here he is when he was younger, really, really handsome guy. That's our number one actor, and he plays Lorenzo Snow, which, as I mentioned, is the fifth uh, president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, the second most important person, uh, actress in this, is uh, Lethe Taji, who plays uh, Sarah Minnie Jensen Snow. That's Lorenzo's ninth and final wife, and she plays the role of mother. Now, as an actress, she was especially known for her roles in uh, The Mailbox, Till Death Do Us Part, and she was in a total of 14 uh, produced uh, videos of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She died in 1986. My most famous, uh, my, my favorite line of all of her movies and 14 movies is the first vision when she stands up in the congregations and says, I believe! That's my favorite line from her. She, uh was a, a resident of Midway and, like I said, passed away in 1986. And she is playing 
Sarah Minnie Jensen Snow, who you can see here in, in, in these clips. Here's Sarah Minnie when she was a little bit younger, and here's another official photo of her. So this is a computer generated, or somebody put this uh, together, which is what Lorenzo Snow would have looked like uh, next to his wife. So, I mean, why did the church commission this video? So this was originally a 30-minute commission, and it grew into a 50-minute production. That's the longest one uh, to date. Uh, hundreds uh, uh, from the BYU Motion Picture Studio. Hundreds of church members were involved, and saints in St. George, including some who had been president in the actual conference 60 years ago, prior with President uh, Snow, were particularly stalwart in helping to create this film. And President David O. McKay, who commissioned the film, and who also personally knew President Snow, was greatly moved after watching it in the St. George premiere. It was then distributed to the wards and missions uh, and became BYU's most popular film, and it affected a similar retrenchment and tithing in the church's 1960s financial crisis was solved in part to this film. So the music here is from Crawford Gates. That's the we're hearing uh, Crawford Gates scoring of Through Deepening Trials, which is going to be, you're going to hear that in the beginning, the middle, and the end. That's one of the most common refrains of this film. Now, the filmmaker was Wetzel Orson Judge Whitaker. He was a filmmaker and an animator, and he uh, came from the Disney Studios before he and his brother, Scott Whitaker, came over in, I believe it was 1954, to start the BYU Motion Picture Studio. The two of them ran that uh, for about 20 years and received commissions from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to make films. Now, this, uh, this shot right here is opening up on the Beehive House, which was built in 1854. And we're opening on a scene, of course, that's in 1899. President Snow, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that this church owes over $2 million. I'm afraid we couldn't get 20 cents credit if we put up the tabernacle as security. Ever since the government took over the church properties and assets 11 years ago, it's cost us millions to try and recover them. And still we haven't succeeded. Now, I don't want to appear to be an alarmist, President Snow, but with this indebtedness, the church is truly in bondage. Now, for instance, these notes are due and payable. Some are past due, and the end is not in sight. That's true, Brother Gage. The end is not in sight. Brethren, no one realizes the financial distress we are in more than I. At present, I'm at a loss as to what to do. Financially, the church is in a bottomless pit. In the very depths of poverty. But we mustn't give up hope nor become too discouraged. The Lord will help us work this out in his own way and in his own due time. Of this I am sure. I realize it's true. He hasn't shown the way as yet. So who we see in this scene, well, first of all, we're seeing Brother Gage, or uh, probably better referred to as Elder Gage. He's an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, which makes him a general authority of the Church. Of course, there was uh, many more assistants to the Quorum of the Twelve before 1970s when Spencer Kimball filled out the first Quorum of the Seventy. So, I mean, why was the Church in financial difficulties in the 1890s? Let's just cover that. In the 1880s, tithing contributions declined from about $500,000 per year to only about $350,000 a year in 1890. Just remember that in the 1890s, local bishops and the state tithing clerks, they kept for themselves 10% of all the tithing that they received. In fact, in that time period, only about 17% of church members paid any tithing at all. In the 1899, the church was still uh, was forced to start selling bonds just to raise funds to keep the church solvent. They had to sell like a million dollars in bonds. And that kind of reminds me of the, Caitlin, uh, of the Kirtland Safety Society. Not a really great idea, obviously. What I find interesting about the scene is that there's a couple of pictures on the wall. First, there's a picture of Brigham Young, but there's also a picture of George Washington, and then there's a picture of Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith. I, I find the picture of George Washington to be very interesting since the church at this time did not have a really good relationship with the federal government. 
So the second man here, uh, first of all, uh, Elder Gage was a real assistant to the Twelve who really existed in history, which was the first man that we saw on the scene. But uh, Brother Stout here, he's, his idea of getting the church out of debt, of everybody paying $1,000, it's not supported by the, uh, uh, the historic record. And you can see, by the way, though, pictures of George Washington and also uh, Joseph and Hiram over here, and then a picture of Brigham Young over here. So Brother Stout, I, I can't find him in history. Uh, I, I'm, maybe somebody out there can, can do a little bit more research. I could not find that. And this particular part of this scene was cut out of the revision to the Windows of Heaven. There was a 1979 revision of this film, which, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So Brother Stout's idea basically was that everyone would pay $1,000 to get the church out of debt. Uh, kind of like a, a 700 club, but more like a $1,000 club. So we, we do need to, I do need to talk about uh, what is the history of tithing in the church before we go forward with the rest of the film. So how has the church up until this time to 1899 approached tithing? Well, the first tithing revelation was to Joseph Smith in 1834, but that revelation was only specifically for him and Oliver Cowdery. So in the absence of more specific guidance uh, in 1837, Bishop Partridge, who was the one who's collecting the tithing, uh, set tithing at 2% of one's net worth after expenses. Now, finally, in 1838, we get Doctrine and Covenants section 119, verses 3 through 4, which is um, probably the most... Uh, memorable tithing verses in LDS scripture. And uh, I've got the quote here. It says, quote, The saints shall pay one-tenth of all of their interest annually, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever, end quote. But remember, even up until 1899, tithing enforcement was very lax. In fact, we have in a general conference in uh, 1875, Brigham Young admitted that neither he nor anyone else was paying tithing as it was, as it was originally conceived or, or received. So in the context of this film, tithing contributions, especially after the Edmonds Act in 1888, they started to slow as the saints didn't want to donate money or goods to the church, only to have it seized by the government who was putting the screws to the church over polygamy. I appreciate your efforts. It's no trouble, President. We just want to be of help. Bless you. Bless you, Brother Gage. Brother Stout, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, You're President. Very welcome. May the Lord bless you for your desire to help. Good day, President Snow. Now, most of the musical scoring in this movie comes in between scenes as transitions. And again, the music was by Crawford Gates, the famous uh, uh, Mormon composer. You see, it's very pensive mu music, and he's very, um, very concerned about the state of tithing of the church. I just want to make a quick note here that at the beginning of the movie, the portrayal of Lorenzo Snow by Uri, he's very strong. He's not frail. He's just fine. Everything's great. He has an, You're going to see in the scene here, the, the breakfast scene, that he has a strong appetite. But throughout the movie, you'll see that the weight of the church's indebtedness and of tithing uh, really weighs him down until we get to the central scene of the movie and then his health returns to him so he plays the arc of being strong and good because life you know life is good he realizes the church is dead his his health starts to become frail then he receives the revelation about tithing the church cl climbs out of debt and his health returns to him it's a unique arc it was a good breakfast, mother. yeah so here's our first look at uh, lethe on the right, who is Sarah Minnie Jensen Snow. And also we get the first look at uh, Leroy Snow, who was uh, Sarah Minnie's son. I have something to say to you and your mother. I've got to go to St. George, and I'd like you both to go with me. St. George? Well, what's the reason for the trip, Father? That's such a difficult trip to win. Yeah, so that's what's interesting about this scene, is he says, I'm going to go to St. George, and there's, the filmmakers here are setting up a conflict. Instead of his wife and son saying... Um, you, prophet, you gotcha. We're going to follow you. Follow the prophet. They're asking all kinds of questions. They seem to be in great doubt. They have not received a testimony of going to St. George. So they're setting up a conflict in this. And remember, filmmaker Scott Whitaker's script and screenplay were based in large part on the writings of Leroy, who we see here, uh, and uh, Sarah Minnie, who's playing mother in the scene. So again, they're not on board with this plan yet, and they don't even know what it is. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. You want 
a time. Mother, I'm taking you along to look after me. And if the Lord wants me to go to St. George, I'm sure he will bless me with the health and strength necessary to enable me to stand the journey. My son, I don't know yet why I've been called to go to St. George, but I do know that I must go. And I want you to go along. I need your help. And again, the music comes in between the scenes for the most part, and you can see them looking down. So the, the prophet has just said, I am going to St. George, and I need you two to come with me to support me. And what is their response? Their response is, hey, wait, what's going on? Lots of questions. And then they're both looking down as to seem doubtful. Okay, so they're setting up a little bit of conflict in the movie. Now, I very much doubt that that is the reality. I think if President Snow says he's going to St. George, I think his... Uh, wife would uh, support him. Uh, and by the way, we'll cover the fact that Lorenzo Snow had 10 wives, one divorced him, so let's call it nine. And uh, those nine wives are um, conspicuously absent from the film. We'll just put it that way. So uh, also one last note uh, about the Beehive House, because this is supposed to be set in the Beehive House. It was home to Brigham Young and his family members for many years, uh, famously. But Lorenzo Snow, he actually moved into this home in 1900, not in 88, uh, 1899, as was shown in the movie. Lorenzo Snow, he, uh, when he first came to Utah, well, he joined the church in uh, Ohio in the Kirtland uh, period. But when he first came to Utah, he was sent by Brigham Young to Box Elder County, uh, specifically Brigham City, which is where he lived most of his life. He loved it up there. He ran co-ops. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later. So, um, prior to 1899, the converts were expected to pay 10% of their net worth to the church at the time of their conversion, which was basically like an immigration tax. And at this period in time, the church apostles were making about $3,000 per year, and uh, members of the 70 or assistants of the president, they were making about $1,000. So, yeah, they're making plans to go to St. George on the Pullman train, which is accurate according to the historic record. Now, one of the big thing, one of the other big reasons that the church was in so much debt, was the fact that they were had just completed the Salt Lake Temple just a couple of years before. The total cost of making the Salt Lake Temple was four million dollars, and uh, Wilfred Woodruff he spent one million dollars in the last last couple of years just finally trying to get it done after forty years of construction. So that's a huge expense. You'll hear again. There's the music scoring in between the scenes. Now, we're opening up on the telegraph scene here. This is a kind of a comic relief section of the film. It's a slapstick comedy. And uh, the actor on the right, I'm sorry, his name escapes me. Um, he's in a number of church films as well, uh, playing bit parts. So there are three versions of this film, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the three versions of the film, there's a... Uh, the, the, the film version that we're uh, watching now is the 1963 version. That's a 49-minute uh, version of the film. That's the one we're watching right now. Then the church recut this in 1979 and made it into a 32-minute version of the film, which is where most of the scene was cut out, by the way. And then, apparently, there was a 1990 version of the film, that's a 10-minute version that was put out on a DVD. Now, that's kind of a legendary version. I've never seen it. I haven't been able to obtain it. But, uh, like I said, this is the comic relief. He put, they're playing games. He puts his hands up, gets it caught in a mousetrap, and here's your slapstick humor. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so this scene in the revised version was cut down significantly. The key dialogue and the main speech in St. George Tabernacle were left intact, but the other connecting scenes with the minor characters, such as this telegraph office, uh, some train scenes, some of the farming scenes, and other scenes, they were cut out of the 30-minute ver version, making it absolutely perfect, in my opinion, for a Sunday school lesson. So uh, here we have Elder Gage. He's sending telegrams to St. George about Snow's upcoming visit to St. George. So you're about to hear the biggest punchline or the biggest joke of the movie is uh, coming up here in a moment. Get those telegrams, get on that bike and get... Uh, 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 yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Our old 
ultimate destination will be St. George, and our purpose will be to hold a special conference. Please arrange to have five teams and carriages meet us at the rail terminus at Modena. Expect to arrive 7 a.m. May the 27th. That sounds all right. Now, please sign that to uh, Secretary George F. Gibbs in behalf of President Lorenzo Snow. Thanks, man. Oh, by the way, watch out for mouse traps. Here's your comic relief in the movie. And like I said, a lot of the scene was cut out. So everything we have in the film up to thus far has been very accurate. So here is an actual train uh, that they uh, that, that is a period train. They found, for the filmmakers in the 1960s, it was really tough to find a period locomotive that actually worked. A steam engine, because by, you know, by the time this movie had been made, most of those trains had been converted over to diesel. So they finally found a working train in Ely, Nevada, and so they shot those scenes here. So just uh, uh, real quick, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Ely, Nevada, Ely, Nevada is here. So they, they shot the scenes about Ely, Nevada um, over here. According to the historic record, President Snow took exactly 17 people with him on the trip. Instead of what the film said that uh, Lorenzo Snow said he wanted every available general authority, no, he only took a small contingent of about 17 people. So Snow really did ride in a Pullman car, which is what we're seeing here. This is very authentic, just like the uh, film shows. You can tell that this is in Ely, Nevada. Just look at that. Um, you can see those mountains. It's, it's very much like Nevada. So the first real Pullman car was uh, appeared in the 1865s, and it contained a folding upper berths and lower berths. So again, all of this scene was shot in Ely, Nevada. In fact, Harold B. Lee himself helped uh, find um, this period train. Because like I said, steam engines had been retired for a number of years before this film was made. So you can see uh, Uri's acting here is still, he's still pretty spry, but he's a little bit weaker. Um, and here's, we get the first shot here of uh, a President MacArthur, Daniel, du Doug Daniel Duncan MacArthur. He was president of the St. George Stake from 1893 to 1901. He was the fourth stake president of St. George. And they got off the train here in Modena, which was also, uh, it was known at the time as Desert Springs, and it's uh, now it's a ghost town. It was about 75 miles north of St. George, right on the Utah-Nevada border. This railroad line was part of the Utah-Nevada Railroad and was only completed a couple months earlier. It connected Salt Lake to Los Angeles. Now, it needed to stop in Desert Springs because that was one of the only places that had water, and you had to refill these trains with water because they were steam engines. Dina, you can see it, uh, uh, hopefully you can see that on the right-hand side. And you can see the historic census population. Um, it never had very, uh, hard, hardly any people. And after the 1950s, once all of the trains had been converted to diesel engines, which was starting, which had been basically been completed by about the middle of the 1940s, um, this, this town became a uh, ghost, it became a ghost, uh, ghost town. Yep, so this is still in Ely, Nevada. And the drought was so bad that people had been leaving uh, St. George for years. Yes, there was a serious drought in St. George, and it started in 1890, uh, 1898. I still think that this particular scene was shot in Ely. I still think that that is Nevada. And one reason that I say that is I lived in Bloomington, which is a small town outside of St. George, um, when I was in middle school. And I can testify of really how hot and how dry it gets there. I still think we're in Ely at this point, by the way. And some of this scene was cut out of the uh, 1979 version as well. So we're going to transition now to the scenes that were actually shot in St. George itself. So, ha! See, now I believe that we are hit southern Utah with those beautiful red rocks. So it would have... It's about 50 miles from Modena to St. George, and that would have taken a full day. You know, the, these... Um, these carriages, they would have averaged like maybe four or five miles an hour. So it would have been a really, really long day over really treacherous terrain. So these drought conditions that they're seeing here, these are very accurate. I mean, people's livelihoods, I mean, it was really tough living in this period of time, even in the best of circumstances, in such a desolate climate as St. George. 
and if you exacerbate that with the drought, um, really testing the faith of these pioneers. Um, some of them had, had, had started leaving. Uh, during the time of this film, there had been, um, there, there was about 1,700 people who lived in St. George during this time, and over 95% of them were uh, Latter-day Saints. Now, Snow is on his way to uh, stay with President MacArthur and uh, the night before the conference, and that is historically accurate. This used to be a common practice for all general authorities, to my knowledge, even modern-day apostles, and I believe that it was discontinued somewhere in the 2000s. I don't know that for a certainty. So uh, a, lot of the, my a lot of my knowledge from this film comes from the E.J. Bell's uh, Journal of Mormon History in 1994, which discusses several of the differences between the historic and filmic evidence, and uh, I'm going to link to that in the show notes. What's very important, though, is we're going to see President Snow's health start to deteriorate. And importantly, President Snow's health was not mentioned as poor by contemporary accounts. You know, he's pushing 90 years old here, and he outlived all but three of his wives. Um, so, I mean, doing that in the 1800s, that's, I know people think that's somewhat commonplace today, but he was a man of great stamina. And this is my favorite shot in the movie, by the way, a beautiful sunset shot right by where I grew up when I was in middle school in St. George. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, so he is coming to President MacArthur's house. And President MacArthur, I want to say he had six wives at the time. And as you might imagine, we don't get to see the six wives. We only get to see one wife. So yes, Lorenzo Snow had ten wives. President MacArthur had six wives. But in the film, none of them make an appearance. So... President Snow, yeah, he's, 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 his health is deteriorating. We, he did not know why he was going to St. George. And he really did sleep uh, poorly the night before. Yes, I'm very tired. It will only take me a few minutes to fix all of you a bite of supper. Well, I appreciate your thoughtfulness, Sister MacArthur. That'll be fine for the others. But if you wouldn't mind, I believe I'm too tired to bother with supper. If I could... Just have a bowl of bread and milk. Of course, President Snow. Thank you. Right. Yeah, what, what, what's probably important to note is that a trip like this, probably for President Snow, without the use of the train, getting him the majority of the way, getting him 80% of the way, probably uh, might not have even been possible. Although President Snow was a man of absolutely great stamina and strength and vitality. Now, Lethe's acting is uh, always great during uh, this movie. The look that she has on her face is just a perpetual, I'm concerned, but I want to support you. That's the face of support and concern. How can I, how can I support you, but I'm concerned? Well, I mean, he only brought 17. Just a quick note, the nice thing about uh, the church with this video is that the uh, copyright for the music, there is no musical copyright. Unlike some of the other earlier church films where they purchased the music from uh, Hollywood Studios and that music remains copyrighted today. Because Gates, uh, Crawford Gates is the one who did the music to this, the music is not copyrighted. So this does not have a copyright strike on YouTube because it's church-produced musical content, which has not been copyrighted. Now, this is the St. George Tabernacle, and has functioned as a place of worship and a place for community gatherings since 1869, even before it was fully completed in 1875. So here we have uh, Leroy getting out of the uh, wagon first. And there is uh, Joe, uh, the actor depicting President Joseph F. Smith on the right. That's a really, really good costume and a really, really good look. He looks, both President Snow and uh, eventually President uh, Joseph F. Smith, they are dead ringers for who they're portraying. 
So Joseph F. Smith, he is the first counselor in the first presidency and the son of Hiram Smith, the first patriarch of the church. And he's also the man who, in just a couple of years' time frame uh, from this, from this uh, scene, he would become the sixth president of the church. Because uh, President Snow was only president of the church for, I want to say, five, I believe it is five or six years. It was not a very long period of time. Now, what was one, one thing that's interesting is that uh, er, uh, Francis Uri's acting was so convincing on the set that even when the cameras were not rolling, Uri still needed and accepted assistance. He launched himself into the role. Now, this conference lasted for about two days. And the second day included a uh, session that was in the temple, uh, the St. George Temple, which had been completed in 1877. Of course, that is the first real temple in Zion. And by the way, it's been newly renovated here just in the last year. And of course, we hear, we thank the O God for a prophet, which is a common strain when a prophet enters a gathering. So what, what I'm trying to say here is from my readings that the Snow's portrayal here about needing help walking, that's a legendary tale. According to Will Brooks and John Schmutz, who attended the conference, uh, I've got the quote here, Snow, uh, Snow was, quote, alert, springy, keen, and vital, end quote, and nobody assisted him at any time in walking. Now, in the second day of the conference, jo uh, Lorenzo Snow shook the hands of every child. In the, They had a children's only session, and he shook the ch uh, every child's hand in the session the following day. So you would not be seeing children, in my opinion, in this first session because this was for the adults. You had a children's only session, which is when the children would appear. And the reason that he shook hands with everyone is so that the children could say they shook the hand of the man who shook the hand of Joseph Smith. And of course, the, the film opens with President MacArthur, the state president, which was, of course, would be very appropriate. Now, the film, it only shows one session of the conference, but like I said, it was a two-day conference with many, many meetings. Now, no word-for-word -word account of President Snow's first address exists, but there are many diaries, recollections, and newspaper articles about it. And of course, as we're panning out through the through the crowd, there's no polygamy. There's no, there, there's just, there, the polygamy has been totally excised from this film. It's like there is no polygamy, even though this was one of the governing and most important principles of the, uh, of the early church was polygamy. It's nowhere to be found in any way in this film. I don't. You usually don't see a lot of Bible thumping Mormons. That's for sure. Now you see on the right up on the stand, you see uh, Leroy Snow, who was a special correspondent for the Deseret News, and he did write down carefully uh, the sermons from day two. And I believe that this is supposed to be the High Council here. It might be general authorities, but it could also be the State High Council. Now, this is the most important scene of the movie, which is why I'm going to turn it up and remain silent until he receives his revelation. Concerned but supporting. My brothers and sisters, I feel to sympathize with all of you because of the drought conditions. On the journey here from Modena, we couldn't help but see the dead and dying cattle, the dried up streams. May I say unto you, even though we are not suffering as badly from the drought up north, the yoke of oppression is resting heavily on the church because of our indebtedness. As you know, during the past year, it became necessary to issue bonds to the value of one million dollars. I have been grateful to the response of the membership of the church in procuring these bonds. But brothers and sisters, 
this is not the real answer. The church must find some other way to pay its bills. We must find a permanent solution to our financial problems. Now, I, I don't know exactly why the Lord has called me to St. George. But I know he has called me here for a special purpose. For a reason which I feel he will bless us. The big close up, the big moment, the anticipation, the revelation, the inspiration. Brothers and sisters, I understand clearly now wherein we as Okay, so what, what's important here, that's that's the biggest scene in the movie. The dramatic uh, pause that President Snow has, that's, that's disputed. Some say that he had a dramatic pause, others said that there were no pause. And President Snow himself said that he received revelation in two different ways. One was a, a a, basically a confirmation in the mind and another was a head-to-toe revelation and he said that this was basically a confirmation in the mind what's also important about this scene is that the movie omits all of Snow's references to promising that if the Saints paid tithing they would gather to Jackson County Missouri yeah when he says this is the word of the Lord unto you that's kind of like a dog whistle or a Latter-day Saint version of thus saith the Lord now, what is very important here is that the vast majority of contemporary records indicate that President Snow never mentioned anything about rainfall in connection for tithing. So, the tithing for rain prophecy, basically, it made its way into, the, in the, into this movie and to LDS lore, even to, even to today, is because it makes for good cinema, not because it is very accurate. I'm going to discuss that a little bit more uh, later. Now some of the um, some of President Snow's second sermon in day two of the conference that was carefully written down and some of that day two quotes from the conference actually make its way into this movie as if they occurred on day one. Now he's reading the famous uh, used to be a, a scripture mastery for LDS seminary students Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 10 which says bring ye you know bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse where will a man rob God preach it President Snow preach it <laughs> He shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. I also feel to give you a promise pertaining to your part land. This is the most controversial part of the movie. This law fully and honestly from now on, you may go ahead and plow your land, plant your seed, and I promise you in the name of the Lord that in due time clouds will gather, the latter rains from heaven will descend, your lands will be watered, the rivers and ditches will be filled. And you will yet reap a harvest 
this very season. All right, so that's the that's the legendary. There's just no contemporary accounts that back up the tithing for rain prophecy. Now we discussed some of the uh, t how the effects of tithing in the early church, but tithing also obviously appears in the Bible. In fact, Abraham gave a tenth of all he had to the priests of Salem in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, and tithing is mentioned 18 times in the old, in the Law of Moses. And the most famous uh, passage for Latter Day Saints is in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Now, President Snow, in this scene right here, he says that we're going to have a 7 o'clock meeting later that night. But the contemporary record does not show that uh, there was a, a 7 o'clock meeting. There's just no contemporary record of the 7 o'clock meeting. Now, I mean, President's li uh, President Snow's life story was uh, really incredible. He had been um, incarcerated for polygamy for, I want to say it was 9 or 10 months. Um, he served quite a few missions. He served a couple missions too. He was uh, born in uh, Mantua, Ohio. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but he was born near Kirtland, Ohio. And uh, he served several missions in Ohio. He served a three-year mission in uh, England. He served, uh, he served a, a mission to Italy and he served a mission to Hawaii. And this is uh, really back in the time where he did it with all, without purse or script. He went wandering the world, walking um, you know, w wandering the world, walking around, preaching the gospel without personal script. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible story. Now, this band is playing in our lovely Deseret, which was, by the way, my favorite hymn when I was a missionary in Washington, D.C. back in the 90s. The lyrics of the hymn are by Eliza R. Snow, which is the wife of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and also the Second Relief Society president and Lorenzo Snow's sister. And she's the one who invited him to come to Kirtland to begin with, and she was instrumental in his conversion. So this is a clever nod from the filmmakers to, um, to President Snow. If I was going to play a song for President Snow, I would definitely play In Our Lovely Deseret. It's a really uh, clever, clever scene. Um, it was borrowed from the Protestant tradition, uh, this uh, particular uh, tune. It was from uh, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Jesus loves the children of the world. So again, in the shortened version of the film, some of these uh, are cut out because they don't really, they don't really do much as far as the plot is concerned. I mean, technically, this not really a plot to this movie. It's kind of an invented plot, but it's basically a historical uh, documentary, a pseudo documentary. So now, now we're in the second half of the film, which is you know where they're planting in accordance with what President Snow allegedly said in the St. George Tabernacle, saying that if you pay your tithing, then the rains will come. I mean, the faith that these pioneers had, even though that is not technically accurate, but still, the faith that they had is uh, really amazing and inspiring. You know, President, here's President MacArthur here uh, doing what President Snow allegedly said in the tabernacle. It does remind me of one of my favorite hymns, which is With Faith in Every Footstep. That's one of my favorite hymns. With faith in every footstep, we follow Christ the Lord, and filled with hope through his pure love, we sing with one accord. And of course, President MacArthur had a huge family, but we do not get to see them for some reason. So, I mean, basically, this is like a Mormon Western, right? Now we have uh, President Snow traveling back to Salt Lake, and this time he does not take the train going back. Instead, he took a 17-day journey visiting about 16 communities, and Snow hints for the first time in church history during this preaching that tithing will become a, a requirement for ordained office to the priesthood and also for temple admittance. So he's really setting up tithing as something that you really need to do if you want to be a member in good standing. This is uh, something that did not become a total church-wide mandated requirement until, I believe, 1921, whereas you could not have a temple recommend without paying tithing. But up until this point, my understanding is that you could, and President Snow is changing that. So by 1900, there's 42 stakes in the church, and Snow visited almost all of them preaching, nothing, preaching tithing as his primary message. 
in exchange for his soul. The penalty following disobedience to the law of tithing is that the disobedient shall not live among the people of God, but through this law, the blessings of prosperity and success will be given to the saints. If the saints pay their tithing, not only will the church be relieved of its great indebtedness, but through the blessings of the Lord, this will also be the means of freeing the Latter-day Saints from their individual obligations, and they will become a prophet. Um, I mean, I don't think you can find a clearer example of a prosperity gospel than that. those clips right there. Now, of course, back in the day, <laughs> back at this time, uh, the bishop's storehouse, you would pay your tithing um, in goods. You could pay it in goods. You could pay it in services. And even in the uh, early days of the church, people paid their tithing in slaves. Of course, nowadays, uh, your tithing and fast offerings, they're generally submitted in, in cash. Uh, I've always loved working at the uh, Bishop's Storehouse. That's uh, one of my favorite calling slash service opportunities. I uh, remember when I was uh, a middle schooler in St. George, near St. George in Bloomington, I actually uh, was collecting the fast offerings from uh, my route. And somebody paid uh, their fast offering in casino quarters because I guess they hit the jackpot at one of the casinos close to St. George across the border in Mesquite. And I brought those quarters to my bishop and he said, take them back. We don't take those that filthy lucre. I mean, you could also do labor tithing. That was a donation of every 10th day devoted to working for church projects. I mean, it could be livestock, produce, whatever. It wasn't until 2015, I believe, that the church allowed members to start paying tithing online through Zelle or bill payer. Now, these scenes right here are supposed to be have been taking place in the Beehive House, but I believe that that is a set on the motion picture studio in BYU. And again, more of the Mormon Western. The President MacArthur's family just looks like a regular 1960s family. Yeah, I've lived uh, I lived in St. George and looking up to that sun in that summertime again. The conference was in May, so what we're seeing here is in June. And especially since it was in the middle of a already hot drought, it would have been tremendous. Okay, so this is Nephi, and um, think about this, though. Hold on. This man looks like he's about 70 years old. So this is supposed to have taken place in 1899. So as you subtract 70 years old from 1899, you have 1829. So this man was named Nephi in 1829? Uh, he looks like he's at least 70, so <laughs> kind of an anachronism there. I actually think that this could be Nephi MacArthur, the uh, the uh, son of President MacArthur. I don't have anything to back that up, but I um, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I have a feeling that it might be. So we get, yeah, we're back in the Beehive House, and we get these telegrams that are being sent to St. George. Now, that is accurate according to Leroy Snow, and that is according to his memory that was recorded 35 years later. And again, Leroy Snow's accounts, that's where we get most of the filmmaker really draws on Leroy's accounts. Yeah, fair and warmer, so it's... Uh, it's the first day of summer now. It's June 21st. It's been about five weeks since the conference, and there has been no let-up to the drought. So Leroy Snow kind of lionized his father, and um, I would say that some of his accounts, since um, they're in direct opposition to much of the historical record, they would be more fanciful. And Leroy Snow, he was a correspondent for the Deseret News, so he's a newspaper man. He knows how to tell a good tale. He knows how to write a faith-promoting story. And of course, when it comes to church history, the church really, if there's multiplicity of different uh, opinions or witnesses, the church almost exclusively goes with the most faith-promoting narrative. 
So when you go to the church's official website now, you don't see the tithing for rain prophecy. That's been taken out because we basically know that it is not accurate. There's just overwhelming evidence that there was no tithing for rain prophecy. The real prophecy, as I mentioned earlier, was payer tithing and we will be able to reclaim Jackson County, Missouri because we are only one generation away. We're only one generation removed from when the saints were trying to reclaim Jackson County, Missouri as the true Zion. You know, I know people say the Utah Zion. That's not the real Zion. Yeah, when I think of President Snow and what he is best uh, best known for, I definitely think about this movie, and I think a lot of people do too. Okay, now we're about to, uh, there's a blooper in this film. I'm about to pause it and show you the, the blooper in the film. Again, he's supposedly receiving these telegraphs from St. George about the weather uh, updates. Now I'm pausing it here to see you listeners out there. Can you find the blooper in the film? And the blooper is somewhere on this particular uh, telegraph. A telegram. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a hint. So the uh, it says that it's 1889, but this is supposed to have been 1899. So again, it's August 14th, 1899. The drought is still in force, and that is accurate according to the historical record. Again, the heart pulling. The tragedy and the heart pulling at the heartstrings here. And again, President Snow, he's not able to walk around very well because the weight of the, the church members is upon him. If you look at the lighting of the scene too, it's very dark at our level, but there's a light that's going up. Like It's like he's going up to divine light. It's kind of like Moses going to the top of Mount Sinai or the apostles going to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Yep, he's saying that he's not going to eat. He's not eating, and it's kind of like in solidarity with the saints who are suffering in St. George. Again, he's going up to kind of receive revelation. And think about the beehive house. You are a polygamous man with uh, nine wives, and he had children with every single one of his wives. I want to say he had 35 children. I'm not, I'm not sure that exact number. The rest of those children and wives, they don't appear in the movie. I know they would clutter the screen, but this beehive house would have been a madhouse. If you think about reading the accounts of like uh, Susie Young Gates, Brigham Young's most famous daughter, the beehive house was a crazy place with so many people living in there. Like if you've watched Pioneers uh, with Petticoats, that's another movie that uh, shows kind of the insanity of the Beehive House, which is uh, greatly missing in this. So there's about, like I said, I believe that this uh, was set in the motion picture studio, and there's about four rooms that are set for scenes. There is President Snow's room, there's the anterior cha chamber, there's the staircase, and then there's President Snow's room itself. You can see some of the discoloration in this particular film. You see that little stripes that go through the middle? This film was actually digitized from a film reel, not from a VHS tape. That's why the quality on it is not as high as it could be. And incidentally, I also checked this film's copyright with the um, National Copyright the, at the National Archives to see if this movie was copyrighted, and the church has not renewed the copyright on this film. That's why it's in the public domain and it is available to be reviewed in this fashion because there's no copyright not only on the on the film itself but the music also does not have a copyright you need to check both of them to be able to be uh, used so, so that they could be reviewed in this way yeah Uri has really just transformed himself into that president Lorenzo snow he's really 
He's so believable in this role. Uh-oh. So here we have the rain scene. I'm um, feeling very inspired here. <laughs> I'm getting out my checkbook. The prophecy has come true. Now, uh, almost three inches of rain did fall in the latter half of uh, the latter part of August of 1899. That was about three months later. But for the harvest for that year was very much below average uh, for the conditions and definitely not what someone would call bountiful. Now, what's what's also interesting is that the rain that was that they received in August, which I guess is what this is supposedly uh, trying to show, it was extremely destructive because when you have a huge rainstorm after a drought, it cuts everything up and it's really not that great. It can lead to more destruction than help. So yes, they did have a, cr a crop that year, but it was very, very much smaller than normal. So the official accounts of Snow's famous sermon in, this, in the St. George Tabernacle started moving away from Lorenzo Snow's original thoughts to the tithing for rain prophecy beginning about in the 1940s. And it was not until 1902 until the drought was actually fully abated. So if the church releases another update to this, I think that they should have a QR code right here so that you can just, as soon as the scene comes up, you can just bring up your phone and pay your tithing. Small, <laughs> just kidding, small joke, small joke. <laughs> uh, Okay, so now we have the uh, telegraph is being sent to President Snow. Now, the church actually was not fully out of debt until 1907. That's four years after President Snow dies. But the movie wants to tie up all the loose ends. It's just not that great. Uh, think from a filmmaker's perspective. If President Snow gives a prophecy that says pay our tithing, we can reclaim Jackson County, Missouri, and then four years after he dies is when the church finally gets out of debt. It just it doesn't it doesn't have a great film quality to it. Now you'll see that his strength has returned once again. So we have come, we've come full circle. Those windows, by the way, that's an indoor set. Those windows are fake windows. So according to Leroy, seeing his father praying is accurate according to what he wrote down later. His uh, quote from his son, quote, his face was white, almost white, and his eyes shone as I have never seen them before, end quote. So Snow immediately prays to thank the Lord after the drought breaks. And again, he's gone through the first, uh, first, the first room, now the interior chamber, now he's heading to the staircase, and then he's going to end in the fourth uh, fourth room. So they basically only needed to build four rooms of the set. And he feels, look, he, he feels, he's not hobbling, nobody's helping him, he's, he's walking quicker, he feels good. In fact, the lighting on the scene, it's more well lit than previous times. It's showing that the light of the Lord has returned. The drought has broken. So now we're back to the theme through deepening trials that's appeared in the beginning, the middle of the film, and now at the end. We're through the trials. The Lord has blessed the church through his prophet. Rain has returned, and the church is back out of insolvency. And because the church was so close to just being bankrupt. I mean, the thing about it is that when people were paying tithing to the church, the federal government was seizing the tithing. So the money was not going to the church. In fact, the, the federal government was seizing buildings that the church owned and forcing the church to lease those back, uh, forcing the church to pay money to lease them back, you know, was leasing those buildings back to the church. So, I mean, the church was really, in 1899, was in a horrible financial shape, maybe $3 million in debt. And again, they were only bringing in about $350,000 in tithing in 1890, so you can tell what kind of a crippling debt that would be. His face was almost white and his eyes shone as I have never seen them before. Pretty good acting. Through deepening trials and now we get a nice uh, a cut scene here, you know, a, a scene where a fade out, where we're fading into the windows of heaven. Hence the title of the movie. And that's like God shining down on President Snow affirming what God has done. Uh, 
Uh, now, Steve and Brian were the ones who helped digi digitize this film off of a film strip, my understanding. Now, this was digitized in July of uh, uh, July of 2016 by Tom Doggett. And he is the one who uh, really brought us all of these hard-to-find Mormon films. I want to look at some of the comments section that we see uh, through the comments section, which I find uh, really remarkable. So like, the YouTube comment section is really remarkable. It's basically 100% positive comments. I mean, people saying, I know this story is true. I love this religion. Someone asks, is this really Lorenzo Snow? Someone else, he did well. Nine wives, 42 children. Nice job. This film is really kind of like going back in time twice. We are going back in time to 1899, but we're also going back to uh, 1963, which is when the film was produced. Both of those were times that the church was facing significant challenges. So we get this film thanks in part to Tom Doggett and the Hard to Find Mormon videos, which is on YouTube. I actually was able to uh, track down Tom Doggett and talk to him about... Um, I was able to talk to him about this uh, film and how he was able to get uh, the access to all of these films. And it's very, very uh, remarkable. Uh, many, many thanks to Tom Doggett. So I, I do want to cover a couple last things for to sum up here. Now, Snow's promise uh, in the movie of tithing, curing the drought, it just did not happen. Obituaries, journals, media articles, official minutes, that's just incorrect. Even after the effects, uh, the events depicted in this film, in 1899, the church, it, was, it started bringing about a million dollars in tithing per year. So it tripled after this film uh, was, was, was commissioned. Uh, I'm sorry, let me back that up. In 1899, the church was bringing in about a million dollars in tithing per year, and that was up from 350000 in 1890. But that was still not enough. Even though tithing tripled after President Snow's preaching tithing, even though tithing tripled, the church... Um, it still didn't get solvent for another seven years, and that was about four years after President Snow's death. Now, President Joseph F. Smith, he made his famous comment in the 1907 General Conference regarding tithing. And remember, he was there the day that President Snow gave this uh, address. And he said, quote, We expect to see the day when we will not have to ask you for one dollar of donation for any purpose, because we will have tithes sufficient in the storehouse of the Lord to pay everything that is needful for the kingdom of God, end quote. So this is a very famous quote, and it seems to, it seems to indicate to me that this increase in tithing, even though the Doctrine and Covenants section 119 says it will be a standing law to you forever, the interpretation of it and the application of it from the Joseph F. Smith comment, it seems to think that once the church had enough resources that they wouldn't need that high level of donation. You know, the donations had tripled from 1890 to 1899. And so Joseph F. Smith said, yes, we're out of debt now. And once we have enough in the storehouse, we won't need you to contribute as much. That's what I get from his statement. Now, a couple last other sum up thoughts. And Joseph Smith Jr., when he saw the stone cut out of the mountain without hands in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, he saw that as the Church of Christ. But, uh, you know, LDS church growth has been flagging and it has uh, shrunk. Uh, it, the growth has gone, it gotten smaller and smaller every year for a decade. So in my mind, the real stone that was cut out of the mountain was the one that was unleashed by Lorenzo Snow in the portrayed, portrayed in this video and his revelation uh, tithing revelation, which is you know based on this film, the tithing fueled church assets, which grew from basically nothing or in debt in 1900 to 250 billion dollars today, with about 150 billion dollars in Ensign Peak and then about 100 a billion dollars in real estate. So Lorenzo Snow has got to go down as one of the most prophetic leaders of all time, and that is the real stone that is cut out of the mountain without hands. Now, recently the church also reformed some of the tithing uh, categories. Um, that was just a couple of months ago. By the way, I am the host of the uh, of the podcast Mormon. Uh, I, I'm the host of the Mormon News Roundup. I'm the host of Mormon News Roundup, and we covered this in one of our previous episodes. That the church has done several revisions to tithing recently, including the simplification of tithing categories. If you want to learn more about that, then come check out our podcast, which is uh, Mormon uh, the Mormon News Roundup. You can come to our website www.mormonnewsroundup.org. I, one last thing that I want to cover is uh, Elder David A. Bednar in the National Press Club briefing in May, on May 26, 2022, when, at, when he was asked about tithing from the reporter, 
uh, he admitted, quote, that the church doesn't need their money, end quote. So it seems like the fulfillment of President Snow's vision of filling the storehouse has come to completion. So uh, our, I hope you enjoyed this review. This is my first time ever doing a webcast or a web camera or a review of the film of this kind. I've never done anything like this on the internet. I have a podcast, but that's about it. So if you have any constructive feedback for me, please let me know. And if you want to uh, help me review the next film or one of the films that's coming up, we're not only going to do historical documentaries, but we're going to do some of the lighter fare that's offered out there. Some of the more, um, you know, puffball tear jerkers and some of the cringe worthy whoppers if you want to be a part of that then uh, send me a message to mormonmoviereviews at gmail.com my vision is in the future we might even be able to have watch parties where we stream this on youtube and there'll be comments underneath and be able to have interactions with uh, viewers now our next film my next film that we're going to do is the three witnesses and this is in uh, 1968 the old classic there so I want to thank you so much for being a part of the Mormon Movie Reviews pilot episode. And if you love these old LDS uh, cinematic classics, then please come back for our next episode. So long.